start. All right, with any luck. So what I'm going to talk about this afternoon is basically sort of a current overview of our um, work at the University of West Florida that we've been conducting at the settlement site of uh, Tristan de Luna. Um, so the Luna expedition has long been on the southeastern landscape. It followed the Soto expedition of 1539 to 43, uh, and it preceded the settlement of St. Augustine. So in Pensacola, of course, we've long been searching, we, I say that, people have long looked for and wanted to find the settlement site. Um, and even after the first shipwreck of the Luna fleet was found in 1992, it took until 2015 for the uh, settlement site to turn up. So anyway, I'm gonna try to contextualize it a little bit and kind of go over what we've been finding and then show you a whole bunch of goodies, basically what the 16th century Spanish assemblage is uh, at the Luna settlement site, which is a really remarkable site. So anyway, uh, just to give you some context, the reason Tristan de Luna y Arellano was in the southeast was because the Spanish had attempted for decades since Florida was originally found in 1513 to establish a settlement. Uh, up to the point of the Luna expedition, all prior military expedition and settlement attempts were privately financed because that was the way the king did it. They'd get grant um, uh, tax breaks and incentives and governorships and titles but they were all privately financed. So the Soto expedition, for example, uh, was all about Soto taking the money he had made in the Pizarro expedition in South America and then f investing it in his own expedition. But after all of those expeditions, every single leader of every attempt to settle or explore Florida, all major expeditions, had died and all expeditions had failed. So in 1559, uh, Florida, after all of these attempted explorations, Florida was, remained an unoccupied corner of southeastern North America. And so from this map, you can see here uh, the New World as it was when the Spanish had been there for you know, basically half a century or a little more. So not only New Mexico, but the southeast uh, Florida had never actually been successfully colonized, so there was no presence of the Spanish. And the reason that was important uh, to the King of Spain at that time was that the French were beginning to make motions like they were going to eventually try to settle on the southeastern coast of North America. So in order to head this off, King Philip II financed an expedition. He sort of co-financed it with the leader of the expedition, Tristan de Luna. So there's the map that shows the original intent uh, up in the upper left of the expedition, which was to, to make a long story short, which was based on the testimony of veterans of the Soto expedition, the best place to enter Spanish Florida, the southeast, was at the Bay of Ochuce, which was found during the Soto expedition, that's Pensacola Bay. Uh, and then they were gonna go follow, well, find first, and then follow the Soto route over the Appalachian Mountains and make their way to Santa Elena, modern day Paris Island, South Carolina, and set up another colony where that is where they would basically head off any sort of French attempt. Uh, and by the way, the French were indeed trying to target that area, and one year after Luna abandoned his settlement, they did, the French did settle at Santa Elena precisely, uh, where Charles Fort was built. That didn't have a good ending, but nonetheless, they, they were really correct in the sense that the French were, were trying to get a foothold. So the expedition of Luna left from Veracruz. One of the notable things about the Luna expedition is that it, unlike prior expeditions, it was actually staged and equipped out of New Spain. So it was a New World expedition out of Mexico, basically, to settle in Florida. So the material culture and the actual people in the expedition, a lot of them were residents of the New World already. And of course, there were even 200 uh, Mexican Indians or Aztec Indians on the expedition as well. So it was a very different flavor, different character, but nonetheless, it was an attempt for Spain to establish a foothold. So you can see the route they took, a uh, the fleet of 12 ships, 11 under their own power, one was being towed, uh, and they finally made their way after a considerable time into Pensacola Bay, which was their destination. After chucking half of their horses overboard because they died on the way. They still had cavalry though. This is basically, and I'm not gonna focus on the events after the, uh, or not directly associated with the settlement, what I'm gonna focus on is the settlement, but just to give you an overview of what happened to the expedition, the reason Pensacola and Santa Maria de Ochuce, which was established at that time, is not the first permanently occupied European settlement, in large part is due to the fact that there was a hurricane that came across Puerto Rico uh, in, on September 12, 1559, 
And on September 19th, five weeks after the ships had begun offloading and setting up a settlement at uh, the spot we have found on Pensacola Bay, the hurricane came in and just devastated the fleet and settlement. Most of the people survived, but the ships were devastated. And so out of 10 ships that were still afloat in the bay, only three were, uh, were still afloat at the end of the hurricane. And so the subsequent two years of the expedition were mostly about staying alive. Um, they had brought 1,500 colonists, and so they had far more people. And after the sinking of their ships, they had far less food, in fact, almost no food of their own sort. So literally, it was a struggle to survive. Um, so relief expeditions came on four different occasions from Veracruz. The Viceroy of New Spain tried to relieve them. Um, there was another expedition that went directly from Pensacola to Havana and picked up a lot of supplies, including cattle and pigs and sheep and goats. And ultimately, the, the expedition actually moved inland into central Alabama, um, where they thought they might find indigenous groups, Native Americans, who could actually supply them with food because the interior of Alabama is where the corn-growing Mississippian-style chieftains were located. Um, but by the time the Spaniards got there, the Indians had decided they didn't want to share their food with the Spaniards. So they left, uh, burned their villages, cut their fields, and even uprooted all the wild food uh, around the village so that it was sort of encouraged the Spaniards to go home. Anyway, they moved back to the coast. So what we have on the spot of Ochuse is the site that was occupied for the most part by beginning with 1,500 people and then dwindling over the course of the expedition, but nonetheless occupied for two solid years between 1559 uh, and 1561. So here is a map that shows modern day Pensacola Bay, and this is a storm surge map. So what you're looking at is where the high ground is and where the low ground is. And this is very pivotal because it pretty much tells exactly why they settled where they settled. So the goal of the expedition was to move inland very quickly. They were going to set up a beachhead, uh, a port from which they could be supplied, and eventually establish a port colony, and move inland quickly to reconnect with Soto's old route and then move across to the Atlantic. So they had to have easy inland access. So that limits us a little bit in terms of where we would think Luna might choose. Next, he definitely wanted to establish himself where he could see the mouth of the bay and where ships passing the mouth of the bay could see him because of course it was meant to be a port and they needed to know if the French were gonna come in and attack them, et cetera. So the bay mouth was a little farther east than it is today. It's migrated over the five, four and a half centuries since then. The third qualification is high ground adjacent to relatively deep water. So they could bring the ships in pretty close. And of all the places in all of Pensacola Bay, the only spot that actually settles all of, or satisfies all of those requirements is Emanuel Point which just happens to be where Roger Smith and his team in 1992 found the shipwreck, the Emanuel Point One shipwreck. And in 2006, a second shipwreck was found 400 meters late, uh, off, away from it. But it's also where we found the terrestrial settlement in 2015, right on top of the bluff, literally almost within uh, stone throwing distance of where the shipwrecks are. A third wreck was subsequently found when we surveyed in between the previously found wrecks and the newly found settlement. So the third wreck was found in the shallower water. And there's three more left to be found, so more news hopefully coming on that at some point. So this right here, this map shows you uh, where we're located. Let me keep an eye on my time here. Uh, basically, the settlement is on the, t the high ground here in the, inside that uh, blue bubble. All three of the shipwrecks that are currently documented are within that blue bubble in the water portion. So there's two wrecks that are just offshore in about a 12 feet shelf or sandbar and the newer wreck is about seven feet deep, even closer. But the terrestrial settlement is right there, and probably the other three shipwrecks are there as well. So the settlement is situated on a bluff, a high 29-foot tall terrace above sea level, a uh, terrace that overlooks the heart of Pensacola Bay. It fits the textual descriptions perfectly of where Luna settled. He said that the bay, right in front of where the Spaniards are settled when he wrote to the King of Spain via the Viceroy, he said it, uh, that it opens up to three leagues in width, which is about a little, roughly 10 miles. And it's exactly what it care, you know, what you could see um, today. And you can see there is the view from the site, and there is a view on the top uh, from a drone that we sent up uh, over the summertime. All right, so what we did, University of West Florida, uh, to, to make a long story short, uh, this, the site was found by accident. It's in a residential neighborhood, and so a house from the 1950s had just been demolished and cleared, and they were just about to build a new house, and enough rain had fallen on that lot, and so a local resident 
who was a veteran of Judy Benz's excavations in Pensacola um, back in the 1980s, he knew what he was looking for, and he just happened to remember that that was a potential location for the settlement and scoped out the lot and found classic 16th century olive jar and Columbia Plain Majolica, which is a 16th century type that's not typical for uh, Pensacola. Pensacola, if you hadn't realized, was, is absolutely stuffed with Spanish artifacts from the colonial period, but all of them, except for this site, are basically 1698 and forward, 18th century for the most part. This site, on the other hand, is, of course, stuffed with 16th century types, which are very different in many ways from the later stuff. Oh, wait, let me tell you what we're doing here. <laughs> this is a map that over the next year after the find, uh, the Archaeology Institute at the University of West Florida basically financed a year-long shovel test survey. And so we first, before we announced this to the press, in order to sort of drum up public support and get interest among the community, we had a meeting with all the neighbors, basically 120 different house lots. So we invited all the neighbors in and told them what we were about to announce. And we got permission from, I think, all but five of those landowners and did a shovel test survey, did almost a thousand shovel tests over the course of one year. And the reason we dug so far and wide is in order to narrow down and basically bound the distribution of 16th century artifacts, make sure that we really did have the settlement, see how big the thing was. So the end result of those thousand or so shovel tests, one of the most diagnostic artifacts that we find is olive jar, uh, what the Spanish called botijas, uh, large amphora-shaped vessels that were used for carrying wine, vinegar, olive oil, and water, for the most part. Anyway, you can see here the bounding. That's sort of the dense clusters, at least, that show where the extent of olive jar was found to be based on that survey. And it's early olive jar in the sense that it's got characteristics uh, that are distinctive from the later stuff. Here are other categories of artifacts that we found to be a characteristic as well of the 16th century. Uh, up here on the less, left is uh, lead glazed coarse earthenwares other than olive jar. Carrot head nails are these very distinctive type of peaked point nails, about four centimeters long or so when they're whole. They are thought to be in the desert southwest of the US uh, horseshoe nails because they came along on the Coronado expedition. They're found at the Martin site, the Governor Martin site in downtown uh, Tallahassee, but uh, they're not found in St. Augustine or anywhere else in the 1560s or later. So Luna's site, and we have more than 100 of them now, uh, Luna's site is the latest site in North America they're actually known to be found. And it's precisely the same type of nail that was found on the Coronado expedition, which Luna was a captain on. So in other words, this has a similar material culture to what he himself experienced as a member of the Coronado expedition in the 1540s. Spanish majolica that dates the 16th century, really thick and anyway distinctive. And we have a certain amount of Aztec ceramics. Uh, we're talking Aztec tradition ceramics that are red filmed, sometimes with graphite black circular designs with sparkle. They're very exotic compared to southeastern Indian pottery and quite distinctive. And I've been doing PXRF analysis on clusters of populations of sherds, and these sherds definitely do not group with the local native ceramics. So we have a student that I'm working with now who's going to get NAA analysis, neutron activation, to determine for sure and specifically where these Aztec ceramics came from. So anyway, uh, to note here, this is just kind of a list that shows what some basic facts are about the settlement. It was Santa Maria de Ochuce. Ochuce was the name of the native chieftain that Soto's lieutenant, Francisco Maldonado, visited in 1540 and came back multiple times looking for Soto to return to Pensacola Bay, even though he never actually made it. But Santa Maria de Ochuce was the name of the settlement. It later, for some reason, got bestowed with the name Polonza, which as yet I have no idea where it came from. Um, the original population included about 500, maybe 550 Spanish uh, soldiers, half of which were cavalry, half of which were infantry, uh, including less horses than they started with, but they definitely had some. Uh, about 100, for sure, 100 noble Aztec Tenochtitlan uh, Mexica uh, who came as warriors to support the expedition, uh, and about 100 or so craftspeople who were also Mexican Indians, all from basically downtown Mexico City. Uh, six Dominican missionaries who served principally, at least, as missionaries. That was their function to the Native Americans, although, frankly, the Native Americans' relations with the Spanish was not great during the expedition, except when they went deep, deep, deep in the interior. 
And they also brought along family members. There's at least 36 of the soldiers that brought their families, their wives, their kids, who then petitioned Luna at some point in the middle of the expedition that they really wanted to go home so that they wouldn't all perish. Anyway, the original plan was to have 100 lots for 100 heads of household, and then 40 lots in the center of the town for a public administrative district with a plaza and a royal warehouse and presumably a church, well, definitely a church. Uh, so there's a range of structures we're looking for. And you can see here in this era, the Spanish were developing a pretty systematic attempt to create planned new settlements. And so there are many contemporaneous drawn plans that show what a 1559 or so plan would have looked like. And so this is an example, one from uh, Mendoza, Ciudad Mendoza in Argentina. That's the original 1561 plan. And this is the modern day Google Earth view. So in other words, that plan persists even today in a number of these early settlements. And of course, it doesn't for Luna's settlement, um, but presumably they tried at least initially. And this just shows you an example of what a plaza in the center of a town would look like and the little streets and lots in between them. This is essentially what I would expect, something similar to this for the Luna settlement. And we're beginning to see at least distribution patterns that might suggest this is something along the lines of what they did. Here's a drawing that shows the little houses. So it shows that each lot would have multiple types of structures. There'd be residences and warehouses, maybe kitchens. There's a church right on the plaza. Um, and so this is the kind of thing we're actively looking for at the site. So presuming that the 140 lot plan was adhered to, if we draw a rectangle around the olive jar and other artifact distribution, uh, we, the configuration works out nicely so that the upper terrace would be the main settlement. And if we do that, uh, and based on everything we know so far, we can develop sort of a schematic. It's very, very hypothetical. But you can see here, we had a beautiful, basically a pond, a freshwater pond that drained into the bayou next door, which was a good, potential at least, a good source of water. It's been filled in now. It's in somebody's front yard that fills up every time it rains. But you can see where the boat landing is. Uh, we have a channel that led up to it before the 1940s. Um, and of course, that's where I think the, the main settlement would be. Uh, just to show you, it might have looked something like this. Uh, the royal ordinances later said that port settlements should have their plazas and their churches close to the port itself, as opposed to in the center, which is only reserved for settlements in the interior. Anyway, again, this is just based on what we know so far. We think we do have the warehouse, uh, and directly opposite, I think we have the treasurer's house. Um, anyway, so our excavations in the last four years have been focusing on trying to find evidence of activity areas and structures at the Luna settlement. Remember, we're dealing with the biggest 16th century settlement in all of, I think in all of North America. Certainly, well, all of the United States, let's say. This was bigger than St. Augustine. There were far fewer people in St. Augustine and in Santa Elena. So this settlement was gargantuan. And it is archaeologically the biggest 16th century settlement, archaeological site, Spanish archaeological site, uh, in all of the United States, as far as I know, by area, not by density. Anyway, these kinds of structures, just illustrations that contemporaneous to this period would show us what we're looking for, which are post holes in the ground and patterns that might look rectangular broadly. Just to give you a sense also, this was a military expedition that was designed as an advance guard, essentially, to set up a quick settlement and then move quickly into, into the interior. And it's also possible that the typical dining arrangements and the typical camps that would have characterized a European military army, a Spanish tercio in the, in the era, might have characterized what the settlement distribution looked like after the hurricane. So in other words, after they never really decided to move forward with the formal elaboration of the settlement, it's possible that they may have ended up looking like something like this. So in other words, tents, uh, basically what a European army camp might have looked like. So, one of the questions I have archaeologically is, do we have evidence of permanent structures? Do we have evidence of camps? Uh, did we have companies camping together? Did the Aztecs, for example, camp all together? Can we determine that using feature distributions? Can we determine it using artifacts? And just to show you comparable examples, uh, over there is the Fountain of Youth site. You can see it's in a native village that existed previously, so there are not a lot of Spanish structures that you can see. but. Santa Elena has rectangular structures that look like this. So if you overlay a clearer view, you can see this, this is the kind of thing I'm expecting we might find, patterns of rectangular post holes. Well, rectangular patterns of post holes. So four years we've been doing uh, field schools. Uh, we've run a lot of students through this. 
And just to give you a, a general sense of some of my analyses, and I, I'm not going to go through any great detail here, but in breaking the bigger site into analytical areas using Spanish pottery distributions, weight per square meter is the measure. So if we dug one shovel test here, but we dug a whole bunch of units here, we still end up with equivalent measures of how much density of artifacts we're looking at. You can see that the center of the site seems to be the core area, the, de the densest area. So that's where we've been focusing our, uh, distribution, or our excavations. Here you can see the same thing as with wrought iron fasteners, including large spikes and nails and carrot heads. Uh, the distributions are a little bit different and there's some nuances in there, but basically it's the same pattern of density right in the center of the site and a little outpost, we think, on the upper bluff that overlooks the northern part of the bay. Might have been a watch post. We've got a lot of arms and armor related, uh, mail and crossbow bolt tips made out of copper. Lead shot is all over the place. They're casting it right on the spot. Um, we have little scissor marks where it snipped off the recently casted uh, balls. M uh, brigantine armor, brigandine armor, which is a scale mail essentially. We've also got manos, basalt, Mexican basalt mano fragments from corn grinders, essentially from making tortillas. So in the end, the Luna expedition was equipped out of Mexico, and so instead of having a lot of wheat flour and hardtack, they brought along a lot of uh, corn and grain, so that the corn would transport and then be grinded or ground, uh, turned into hominy, and then ground into tortillas to eat on site. And so we have chunks of these uh, metates, which represent probably Mexican Indians working for Spaniards or Spaniards using Mexican tools made in Mexico for their own consumption. So it's a, it's a hybrid new Spanish culture. It's not just pure Spanish culture, it's Spanish and Aztec and everything else they picked up in the Caribbean. We've been doing point plotting, so we're going very slowly, but we've got literally a cloud of every Spanish artifact from the units we're excavating. So we can actually tell how deep they are, the distribution vertically, bioturbation due to all sorts of different factors like roots and burrows, but also we can see the dense clusters that may indicate in this case where about three or four whole olive jars seem to have smashed in one big event. And we've got a lot of cross mends in post holes to the surface and it's really amazing what we've been able to do. And just to give you a sense uh, here, there's post holes that we found uh, over the last three years. You can see they're not very impressive, but it is sand, it's all coarse, essentially beach sand. Uh, so we've been very careful to try to identify specific features that may be post holes, and that's currently the pattern that we seem to have in this one area, which is where all the, all the smashed olive jar that cross men to each other seems to be. So based on a variety of other lines of evidence, this may be a structure associated with one of the royal officials. My sense is it's the treasure because of a piece of a scale weight we found, which relates to issuing money. But that's a, that's a longer story than I have time for. We do have uh, subsurface features. This is a trash pit that was absolutely stuffed with 16th century material, including not just Spanish material, but also smashed Native American vessels, which clearly indicate the Spaniards were looting and bringing in, or maybe even trading to some extent, native pots for their own use in the village, which is typical for that period. There's a cross section of the trash pit with big barrel straps and large pieces of pottery big uh, deer antler, a bale of wire, brass wire. You can see here a huge spike, a Native American vole. A flagellation star made of silver, which was used for personal penitence, called a disciplina in that era. Not at all uncommon in the probate records of the era. Anyway, a range of things. <clears throat> Just to give you a sense then, as I wrap up, I want to show uh, some of the artifacts. Um, these are typical 16th century Spanish majolica, uh, basically tin enameled uh, tableware, mostly platos and escudillas, which are bowls, uh, but also some other vessel forms. Uh, it occupies maybe 5% of the whole assemblage at the site, so it's, it's, it's actually not as common as other types. But we've got a range of different types, all of which are nice 16th century. We have quite a bit of earthenwares, coarse earthenwares, olive jar, of course. We have lead glazed redware, which is basically the standard cookingware, cazuela sort of casserole dishes, and ollas, which are cooking jars they'd put on top of either iron uh, grates or maybe on top of these uh, braziers made out of ceramic. These are some of the Aztec objects that we have. You can see that interesting little circular pattern of sort of sparkly graphite on top of the red paint. And there's another vessel over there. We have over there a ceramic spindle whirl. We think it's a spindle whirl. 
Another object that may be a brazier leg, although I've looked at it and wondered whether it was a lip plug or an ear plug or something like that. Uh, maybe a large bead, maybe a spindle whirl again, although it's a little lopsided. But these are definitely made out of exotic clays and definitely not, neither Spanish nor Native American. Lithics, we finally found this summer, sort of by accident, uh, one little piece of an obsidian blade, which matches the several obsidian blades that were found on the Emmanuel Point One shipwreck and may be associated with these big bladed wooden clubs that the Aztec warrior, traditional Aztec warriors would have used. And those are examples of the basalt grinding stones. Here's some examples of typical fasteners. Uh, we have several of these. They look like cotter pins, but they're found on the Santa Elena site and they seem to have been used as hinges. So in other words, they were hooked together to make a door hinge essentially. Uh, and lots and lots of nails and spikes. Um, there's one of those carrot heads. We have some really huge spikes. Uh, this summer we found a, just an abundance of them in an area where we have a burned post, which we radiocarbon dated to the late 16th century. So it looks at least like we have the large framing nails associated with one of these larger structures. Here's uh, six terrestrial copper crossbow bolt tips. They're hammered. Spanish-made ones were made out of iron. Uh, the Mexican-made ones were made out of copper. Virtually all of them on the Coronado expedition in the southwest were copper, just like this. Uh, and there's one of these that's been found in northwest Georgia in the province we think is Cusa, which is where the Luna people went in the summer of 1560. And more lead shot and these little things, which are fired co uh, clay balls, which were apparently fit in a crossbow and used for bird hunting. You don't use an arrow, you use just little thing, little clay balls. It's a, called a bodoque in the 16th century, even though nowadays that term is reserved for something different. Lots of armor fragments. Uh, I like the little armor rivet rosettes. We found these two things in the area. I've always said that those little rivets are where Luna was banging his head on a, on a pine tree and popping off rivets because he was, of course, about to lose his, uh, his honor and his money, uh, which he did. He, was, he eventually died in, in virtual poverty in Mexico City about 12 years afterward. These are some of the fragments of uh, a tire. We have lots and lots of little aglets, which are like lacing tips, like your shoelace tips, but this time made out of brass. And I know it's brass because I've been PXRFing all of our copper and cooper's materials. So buttons, little iron hook and eye, and lots of these little sword belt hanger fragments, which would be where a belt would go around and they'd hang their sword scabbard using these types of hooks uh, and fasteners, usually made out of brass, apparently cast brass. Some of the personal items here, a, thumb, a thimble made out uh, probably in Nuremberg, Germany, based on the fact that that was the production center in this era. Tons of little brass uh, straight pins, a little bale of brass wire, and then a brass wire finger ring that somebody seems to have improvised making the exact same type of copper wire or brass wire. A whistle fragment made out of pewter. These are some of my favorites. Uh, the one on the left is a balance scale weight. It's 45.1 grams, which is precisely 10 castellanos, that's a unit of measure used for measuring gold. And there's no way, of course, that uh, they were planning on finding anything in the way of gold. I mean, certainly they would have been happy, but basically this would have been part of a set of weights used by the treasurer to measure anybody who died on the expedition's possessions. They would have to weigh the, how, how much gold, how much silver, they'd have to evaluate all their property and then auction it off. And one of these weights was lost in this particular house. It's got an X and a castle symbol and that's exactly what it should be based on 16th century uh, books. And this thing has a hole through it and we thought it might be a whistle, we thought it might be some sort of a... Anyway, a lot of people put their mouths to it before we figured out that... <laughs> Anyway, we think it's probably an actual enema pump nozzle um, because it, apparently some has been found on shipwrecks just like that. We have quite an assemblage of uh, glass beads, which were not presumably meant for Spanish use for the most part. I've done a lot of research on documentary evidence and glass was not used for rosaries for the most part because it breaks too easily. These would likely be trade goods. So the ones that didn't get to the Indians are the ones that fell, were lost in the sand here at Pensacola. And we have classic assemblage of mid 16th century beads, which is much more characteristic of the Soto expedition than it is of the stuff that occur appears later. One reason for that may be that they emptied the warehouses in Mexico City of old trade goods and sent them on the Luna expedition, which may mean that our assemblage is actually uh, not contemporaneous with what was going on in Spain at the time. We do have a little cut, cut copper sheet there that may be part of an attempt to make a trade good. 
And finally, my last favorite item, it came on the very last day of field school. Yeah, I love it. It's teeny tiny, I mean, but it's a uh, brass uh, horsey <laughs> that's gilt. Uh, the horse is gilt and the chain is gilt. So it would have looked really pretty originally. Uh, now it's obviously somewhat beat up, but it was found tangled in a root. It was excavated in place. So that was found in an area that I've long thought might be Luna's actual residence. So it is possible, at least, that that might have been something that adorned his bridal, or it might be something he actually he or somebody else in his household wore. Anyway, the excavations are ongoing, and that's just a sampler of sort of where we stand, and I'm going to leave it at that. I think our time, my time is up, so thank you very much.